and welcome to worship with the congregation of St. Andrew's United Church in Cumberland, Ontario. It is a beautiful day here in the Ottawa Valley. Um, at least it is on my side of the river. I hope it is wherever you are worshiping from as well. This morning we will be celebrating communion together. So if you haven't had an opportunity yet uh, to prepare your elements, you can get a little uh, piece of bread and a little cup of juice or tea or glass. I have my bread and my cup here ready for us to celebrate in a little while. We um, welcome Jerry to uh, our worship service this morning. She'll be reading scriptures and we uh, thank you, Jerry, for coming and being with us. It was great to see your smile already this morning as we were preparing uh, to go live. Um, exciting announcement. Next week, St. Andrews will be streaming on YouTube. Um, some, something a little bit different, but you will be getting, if you haven't already, you will be getting all of the information you need. You should be getting an email this week um, to let you know um, how, how that will happen. Uh, there'll also be a link on the, or the uh, Facebook page. So um, it's, a, it's a way to invite um, more people in. Some people have uh, problems with, with Facebook, so it's a way just to open up our, our worship services so to make it more accessible for more people. So stay tuned um, for that email. And we'll see you on YouTube next week. We have some birthdays to announce this morning. So if you are celebrating, we wish you a wonderful, uh, a wonderful day. Uh, some new ways to celebrate this year. March 11th, Owen W. March 11th, also Pat H. And March 12th, Marie R. So happy, happy birthday and God's blessings on you as you enter a new year. Let us sing together, all beautiful, the March of Days, verses uh, 1, 2, and 3. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 19, uh, which is one of the scripture passages for this week, and I uh, read from the version entitled The Promise. It's a contemporary English version. The heavens keep telling the wonders of God. 
and the skies declare what God has done. Each day informs the following day. Each night announces the next. They don't speak a word and there is never a sound of a voice. And yet their message reaches all the earth and it travels around the world. In the heavens, a tent is set up for the sun. It rises like a bridegroom and gets ready like a hero eager to run a race. It travels all the way across the sky. Nothing hides from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect. It gives us new life. God's teachings last forever and they give wisdom to ordinary people. The Lord's instruction is right. It makes our hearts glad. God's commands shine brightly and they give us light. They are worth more than the finest gold and are sweeter than honey from a honeycomb. Come, people of God, let us worship God in joy and in faithfulness. Carol is going to lead us once again in the Lenten candle liturgy. And good morning. This is from Reverend Stephanie. Douglas Steer wrote, the pressure to do more and go faster is one of the subtlest forms of violence in our society. Think about those words. There is so much that clamors for our attention and pushes us to hurry. Even those of us working at home are discovering a new kind of busy. And the distractions, we are bombarded with sounds and sights from the clock that awakens us to the mini screens, the phone, the TV, the computer, all competing for our attention. Where can we find the time to listen for the still small voice of God? The drive to keep on top of things is, it just prevents us from slowing down, taking time for peace, for silence and for prayer, for communion with the indwelling love that nourishes us. Let's listen now. There is a place of quiet rest deep in the heart of God. That spark of divine love dwells within you. God is the time and God is the place. In Lent, we journey to the parts of ourselves known only to God beyond the pressures to do more or go faster. Let the Lenten gifts of Jesus' words and actions reach us there and let it teach us the wisdom of what truly matters. Let's be still for a moment. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the violence done to us and our loved ones when we give in to the pressure to do more and go faster. When we ignore the love that calls us into being and calls us to co-create the commonwealth of God here and now. Let us pray. Draw us together in your love, O oh God, and may our restless hearts not resist you, but instead find their rest and nourishment in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Morning. Our first reading is from Exodus 20, 1 to 17, the Ten Commandments. I am reading from a contemporary version of the Bible, The Voice. I am the eternal your God. I led you out of Egypt and liberated you from lives of slavery and oppression. You are not to serve any other gods before me. You are not to make any idol or image of other gods. In fact, you are not to make an image of anything in the heavens above, on the earth below, or in the waters beneath. You are not to bow down and serve any image, for I, the eternal your God, am a jealous God. As for those who are not loyal to me, their children will endure the consequences of their sins for three or four generations. But for those who love me and keep my directives, their children will experience my loyal love for a thousand generations. You are not to use my name for your own idle purposes, for the eternal will punish anyone who treats his name as anything less than sacred. You and your family are to remember the Sabbath day, set it apart, and keep it holy. You have six days to do all your work, but the seventh day is to be different. It is the Sabbath of the eternal, your God. Keep it holy by not doing any work. Not you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, or any outsiders living among you. For the eternal made the heavens above, the earth below, the seas, and all the creatures in them in six days. Then on the seventh day, he rested. That is why he blessed the Sabbath day and made it sacred. You are to honor your father and mother. If you do, you and your children will live long and well in the land the eternal, your God, has promised to give you. You are not to murder. You are not to commit adultery. You are not to take what is not yours. You are not to give false testimony against your neighbor. You are not to covet what your neighbor has or set your heart on getting his house, his wife, his male or female servants, his ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The Gospel reading is John 2, verses 13 to 22, reading from the New International Version. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples re remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus has spoken. Thanks be to God for these readings from scripture. These are the stories of our faith history. We will now sing him Voices United 660, How Firm a Foundation, verses 1, 2, and 5.
Would you pray with me for a moment, please? Uh, these words from Psalm 19. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our Redeemer and our Protector. Amen. So Jerry read to us this morning those words that we call the Ten Commandments. <laughs> We often think of these 10 commandments as the thou shalt nots or the, the big 10 don'ts, don't do this, don't do that. But perhaps, perhaps they're not so negative. If we look at them from a different angle, remember that crystal prism that I talked about a few weeks ago, I think it was. If we look at them through a crystal prism or with our heads cocked in a little different angle, <clears throat> we might see them in a new light. We might just see them as a way to practice faithfulness. One of the reasons that I like to use different translations of the Bible in my uh, preparations for Sundays and also sometimes during a worship service um, is because that it, it helps me to see the scriptures in a new light, in a different way. It gives another perspective just the change of a word or two, not to alter the meaning, but to help us expand our thinking. Like a description on, of light on snow, perhaps. We can say that it sparkles, or we can say that it shimmers. It's a subtle difference, but the different words can trigger a new response. It helps us see, to understand, in a, in a little bit different way, in a new way. In case um, you didn't notice uh, this morning, we have already heard from three different versions of the Bible. <clears throat> Psalm 19 that I read as the, the uh, call to worship was from the contemporary English version called The Promise. The reading of the Ten Commandments in Exodus was from The Voice, which is another contemporary version. And the gospel was from the New International Version. And these three are all scholarly and well-researched, but they tell the same stories. They all contain the wisdom and the essence of the Bible, of the scriptures, of our faith tradition. And they were all written to support our faith journey to engage us in our ongoing spiritual formation, our Christian education, our living relationship with God, with Jesus. Learning something new. Learning something new each week as we read the scriptures. Who among us has not learned something new this year? Now, I'm not talking about learning how to make sourdough bread, which you may have done, and it's a wonderful thing to do. I love making sourdough bread. 
And we have, many of us, learned new skills during our times of isolation and, and lockdown. But I mean those deep life lessons, lessons about what is really important to you, to your soul, to your very essence. What is it that you will take away from this pandemic time that has helped you be your best self? It probably, whatever it is, it probably has not been an easy lesson. But those core truths that we hold most dear are usually hard won. I can't tell you for sure at this point all that I have learned. But I can say that losing my mom just a year ago, just before the pandemic started, and losing my dad a couple of weeks ago, and my faithful dog just a month before that, has opened up my heart and my soul to some profound moments of both insight and sadness and many other emotions. And I realize that I'm not the same person that I was a year ago. I realize that I have changed in my understanding of what life is for, what life is about, and what my life is for, and who I am in that life. It has reinforced in me the need to meet life with an open heart, even when our hearts are broken. Because that's what it means to love, I have discovered. And that's what Jesus was all about, love. That's what God has been about since the beginning of time, since the first explosive moment of creation when the breath of God created life out of chaos. Because of God's love, we are. Creation is. It all comes down to our understanding of that, what we say, God is love. We had no idea a year ago that these last, what these last 12 months would bring. In order to make sense out of much of what has happened, we have had to look at many things differently from a new perspective. We've had to learn new skills, sometimes in order to survive and sometimes in order to thrive throughout the ever-changing landscape of this past year. One of the most used terms for businesses and organizations that we've heard a lot of in the past month is pivot. We've had to learn to pivot, to change direction without taking a step. We have had to learn this hard lesson. It is hard, but we are becoming adept at it, at least sometimes. Because we are resilient. We are a resilient species. We have been created that way. Like any new skill, the skills that we have learned this year will need to be practiced if we want to keep them. We will need to let them work within us with patience and gentleness, with love and compassion for ourselves and for each other. So with this in mind, let's go back to the Ten Commandments. Here's a bit of context for how they came to be. The Hebrew people, you will remember, had followed Moses away from slavery in Egypt and into the wilderness. Their whole lives had been changed. They had been slaves now for generations, and they did not know any other way to be. There had been restrictions for them on everything they did, on every aspect of their living, and it had been getting worse and worse over the past many years. These folks knew all about rules and laws. They knew about restrictions and curfews. 
And they knew the severe repercussions of ignoring those rules. After they had been in the wilderness on the far side of the Red Sea, away from everything that was familiar to them in Egypt, Moses realized that the work wasn't done and that the community needed some help. They needed some structure. They needed a purpose. They needed to figure out who they were as a people again and how to move forward together. Well, the initial plan had worked really well. They had escaped and they were now free from slavery. But now what? They had their freedom. But what did that mean exactly? How were they to be God's people now? How would they reestablish themselves as a community without the rules and the laws and the and the, the restrictions of the way they had been living before. <clears throat> so Moses, as Moses would do, took these questions, these uncertainties to God. Up the mountain, he went to talk to God again. There was a lot of going up and down the mountain for Moses, ongoing conversations with God, as the relationship between God and Moses and God and God's people unfolded. Imagine the conversation. Moses says to God, you got to help me, God. Me and the people, we need something to go on. You got us this far, but now what? Where do we go from here? How do we live together? How do we learn to be your people again, to live in community as your people? How do we reclaim this promise that you made to our ancestors that you will be our God and we will be your people? How? Well, God thinks for a moment and then says, okay, I've got it. Here are a few things you can do. Moses, write this down. So God begins to give Moses some guidelines to help the people find themselves again to help them on their way to become themselves again in a new way. These 10 commandments, as we so often call them, are not principles, 10 principles for success. Rather, they're a prescription for a way of life, a way of being together, a way of being in community. They are in fact, 10 freedoms as a teacher of mine reminded me this week. 10 freedoms, 10 reminders of how much the people mean to God and how intertwined their lives are, not only with each other, but with God. You are mine, says God. You don't need any other gods or anything else to worship. You are mine. You are mine and I am yours and you are free to worship me. You don't need any icons or idols, says God, because I have already made an image of myself, and it's you. You are made in my image, and you are free to live. We need to remember that these words were addressed to an enslaved community, slaves, people who were without freedom for generations. And God says to them, you are free. You are free to honor each other. You are free to respect each other. You are free to honor your ancestors and their faith and claim that faith heritage again, to claim the truth about who I am and who you are and who we are together in relationship. Because of that relationship, you are free to have enough. You don't need to take what isn't yours anymore because you have enough. And God says, you are free to rest. To slaves who had had no rights and no time off until just a little while ago, this 
idea of rest, of Sabbath, was a life-changing concept. As God declared a day of rest, a day of Sabbath, God says to the people, I will rest and you are free to rest with me. You are free to be honest and truthful. You are free to share with one another. You are fear free. You are free to practice respect and gratitude. You are free to love and be loved. So there you have it. A new perspective on the Ten Commandments. The Ten Freedoms. It is a great blessing to know freedom in this way. To know deep within us that we have enough, that we are enough. And when we recognize within ourselves the freedom that comes from knowing we are God's beloved people, we are God's beloved community on this earth, we become the blessing that God promised so long ago to our ancestors, Sarah and Abraham. And in that, we become a blessing to each other to God, to all creation. May it be so. Amen. Our communion hymn this morning is uh, Voices United 480, Let Us Break Bread Together. Friends and companions on the journey, our dance with God begins in the mists of time. God loves us and has a place for us, no matter who we are or what we have done. Wherever we are on the journey of faith, we are welcome to share this meal, this communion meal of bread and wine. God welcomes us all, children and adults, gay and straight, black and brown and white are all welcome. So come now, bring your faith and your faithlessness, 
Bring your love, bring your questions, bring your commitment and your challenges. You are welcome to share this meal at Christ's table. As we prepare to share our communion meal together, even in our separate spaces, we call to mind those who are on our hearts this day. We pray for those in need in our own communities and around the world. We pray for the sick and the dying. We pray for the grieving. We pray for those who are alone, those who live in isolation because of the pandemic. We pray for children learning in new ways this year. We pray for those who have lost jobs and homes and livelihoods. We pray for those on the front lines who serve us and provide us with all of our needs. We pray for ourselves in our own loss and grief. We pray for those on our prayer list. For Reverend Stephanie, Reverend Neil, Phyllis, Ina, Florence, Gladys, Stella, Alan and Ethel, Shirley, Doug and Ina, Bruce, Gertie, Yvonne, Fred and Amy, Marva, Doug, Sadie, Marjorie, B, Margaret, Joy, Mari, Trudy, Dwight, Elizabeth, Lois, Linda, Stan, Alice, Maureen, and Sophie-Anne. We continue to pray together as we sing the Lord's Prayer. God is with us. We lift up our hearts and we give thanks to God. In all the stories of our faith, in the flood, in the depths, in the unrelenting rain, our God is with us. In the desert, in the thirst, in the unrelenting sun, our God is with us. You, O oh God, Sing the colors of promise, and your rainbow is our sign. We wander from your way, and you are with us in all our wanderings. You are with us on our journey. We falter in our faith, and still you have faith in us. We turn away from our sister, our brother, and still you bind us together as your people, we turn away from creation and you remind us that we are your creatures too. Before us stretch the days of pilgrimage. Before us stretch the dark nights of the soul. Before us our Lenten journey. And still, O oh God, you are with us. The old, old story wounds anew we stumble on the road of Lent. 
and you gift us as the one we follow. Jesus, teacher, healer, table turner, the one who eats and drinks with sinners, companion, the one who breaks bread with us, true vine, the one who shares life's cup with us, seeking bread for the journey we call Lent, seeking the wine of refreshment for our desert days. We come now for sustenance. And so we remember, and so we reenact, and so we are encouraged. As Jesus did with his friends, so Jesus does with us now. Together they sat at table in the same spirit that we gather around our own tables. Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my life, my body broken for you. And then Jesus took the cup, he blessed it, he gave thanks and he offered it to them saying, this is my life poured out for you. This is the bread of life. This is the cup of blessing. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The bread of life. the cup of blessing. Let us pray. For the bread we have eaten, for the wine we have shared, for the life we have received, we thank you, God, Grant that what we have been done and have been given here may so put its mark upon us that it will remain always in our hearts. Grant that we may grow in love and understanding and that ours may be lives of faithful action. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now it is time to finish our worship service. And as we leave this time of worship together, let us remember that we are surrounded by the presence of God. We are surrounded by the love of family and friends and neighbors and people we do not even know. Even in our separateness, we are inseparable from that great love. So let us go remembering that we are God's beloved sister and brother to every person, every creature, all beloved of God. As we are beloved, so may we be love. The peace of God be with you. Amen.
before I do our postlude, I thought I would give you a little bit of a history on this, um, in case you don't know. This is it's based on Let Us Break Bread Together, and it is one that I have done for many years at almost every communion service um, that I have participated in for many years. Um, but it was derived from a gathering hymn sung by American slaves in Virginia. And um, the communion verses were added after the Civil War. So it, it ties in with our Black History Month as well. <laughs> <laughs> 